there is such a strong absolutistic and need for God and uh, you know, linear rationalistic trend in Western philosophy that uh, I was looking for alternatives. And then as a college senior, I took a course in Chinese intellectual history or early Chinese philosophy from the history department. And then there, I was very excited to see that philosophers were drawing on human resources, human intelligence, human instincts to develop their ethics and social philosophy. And their ethics and social philosophy seemed just as comprehensive and adequate as the Western varieties, and they had no, uh, no need to rely on absolute reason or, or absolute God or something like that. So that sort of drew me into, Western, uh, into Chinese philosophy. And then when I was looking at graduate schools, well, first of all, I noticed the eminent author of our logic book, uh, who's from Duluth, Minnesota, was, had uh, retired from Michigan and gone to the University of Hawaii. And I discovered Hawaii has a very outstanding uh, east-west philosophy program where you can do Indian, Japanese, uh, and as well as Chinese philosophy and West, all sorts of Western philosophy. And the tuition was reasonable. <laughs> so I uh, decided to go there and well, continue my Western philosophy, but go deeper and deeper into Chinese philosophy. And then uh, you know, ultimately I learned classical Chinese and did a dissertation on a, a sort of medieval Chinese uh, philosopher. Uh, and oh, okay, uh, when it was time for me to work on my dissertation, then I, I left this country and went to Taiwan where to find a, like a tutor to read ancient texts together. And meanwhile, I started teaching at National Taiwan University. So uh, during the next few years, uh, I read hundreds of pages of classical Chinese texts and wrote my dissertation and, uh, and kind of gained my full credentials at my university. And I've sort of been in kind of a dilemma of teaching in the English department and doing research in my own fields. But the, the university recognized my research sufficiently that I was appointed to, the, to be the assistant dean at the Institute for Advanced Studies at my university uh, in relation to humanities research. So I, I feel my work has been uh, influential to some extent. Uh, every five years I go to the the eminent uh, uh, East-West Philosophers Conference at the University of Hawaii. And whenever I speak on the panel, I, f I find there's a uh, full audience and a lot of uh, discussion and feedback on my work. So even though I'm working in virtual isolation in, in Taiwan, uh, my word is getting out. So, uh, so I, I feel you know, intellectually satisfied in that. Uh, respect and also my new position gives me opportunities to travel to conferences globally so I have more and more uh, intellectual con communications both in uh, Western philosophy, Chinese philosophy, you know, as well as you know, crucial world issues uh, at the present time. Okay. Oh, and from a Minnesota perspective, one of my sidelines is uh, Thorsten Feblin. Uh, he, studied in my hometown. He's also from a Norwegian farmer background. And uh, I wrote two very substantial papers on Torsten Feblin. Uh, I think there's an ag agricultural connection that, that roots him and roots Chinese philosophy and sort of puts everything in a connected <laughs> a frame of reference. Okay. I guess that's OK for openers. <laughs> So Confucius is someone you spend time thinking about. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be self-indulgent a little in this interview because Confucius is, is a passion of mine. So I am, I really, there's some things I really want to know. Uh, oh, and, okay. And maybe I can just, just press some of those questions. Oh, certainly. What mm -hmm. What's 
I think the biggest problem Western students have with Confucius when they go after him seriously is the tendency of him to mush into everybody else. Hmm. Mm -hmm. In other words, and also it's a sort of fortune cookie tendency. He says a lot of things a lot, a lot of people say. Mm -hmm. And also, when you actually study, you know, people tell you what Confucian doctrine is, it turns out it's, they sometimes are actually bringing in rather later stuff to tell you what Confucian doctrine is. And yeah, it becomes an orthodoxy. It's very, it's difficult to kind of get a focus on the man. It's also uh, difficult to get a focus on what's sort of particular and original about it. So I think the question that's been bugging me for a long time is, what is it that he did new? And how does one understand him mm -hmm. as a new figure? Mm -hmm. It was, I presume, a bunch of kind of wisdom literature, ritual literature, a bunch of practice in place when he came on the scene, mm -hmm. uh, an at least an aristocratic tradition of excellence and good living. Right, right. That sort of thing. But what is it that he contributed to the, the intellectual climate of China? Okay. Well, he was the first like independently known uh, thinker and and a teacher, there, there wasn't any before him. And he created the whole uh, vocabulary of like moral psychology, human relationships that didn't exist in a very clear or systematic way before him. And also, uh, he doesn't strike you as a, like a bold new person because he tries to portray himself as not an originator but as a transmitter He's transmitting the way established by the, the early sage kings and so forth. Uh, but this is sort of this has something to do with how Chinese society operates. That I think people think if they stand out and claim originality, they'll be knocked down by the other people in society. So they try to uh, protect themselves. That oh, this is nothing new. I'm, this is from the sage kings. But but actually. Like, for example, Confucius' teaching of Ren, uh, benevolence or humaneness or, or something. Uh, before him, this word only meant kindness, like being a nice person. But for him, it, ultimately, it, it became the most important virtue of, of fulfilling one's human relationships, doing one's best to uh, take care of the people one is responsible for. And like, uh, uh, well, I guess the story unfolds in the sense that in Confucius' lifetime, the, the fabric of Chinese society was falling apart. The tribute states were not paying allegiance to the center. Uh, the sons of the rulers were not honoring the rights of the fathers. They were you know, murdering their fathers, and the brothers were killing each other. Uh, people had lost sight of their human relationships and were, you know, fighting for their personal interest. And Confucius' teaching is, in a sense, to remind everyone that uh, every person reflects a network of relationships. There's no such thing as a pure into, uh, individual. And, and then uh, when you realize your relatedness, then you realize your nest of responsibilities and duties and so forth. And then, so his whole teaching is to uh, like remind people of that and, and to teach the the rituals the purpose of rituals is to uh, to express one's own dignity by showing respect for others and the the whole purpose of rituals for Confucius is to sustain and support and, and maintain the human relationships that are the, the fabric of society uh, his notion of appropriateness like his four main virtues are benevolence, appropriateness, rituals, and wisdom. The sense of appropriateness uh, is very different than Western ethics. Like Western ethics is more like you do things on principle, like you keep promises on principle, or and you think of the ramifications. But for Confucius, it's more like in this situation, 
what is the most balanced way to you know, respect everybody and to give everyone their due. So for him, it's never purely on an abstract principle. It's always in the nexus of events and circumstances. So like you don't have any dilemma of truth-telling in Confucius. Like for Kant, should you tell the murderer where the intended victim is? Or should you tell a lie? And then for Kant, it's a big moral crisis. But for Confucius, the, the, the lie is only a speech act. And uh, in some situations, to tell a lie is a good <laughs> speech act because you're protecting the would-be victim. So appropriateness in Confucianism is far more subtle okay, than, than Western. And ritual is a far more positive thing than, it, than Westerners think of. And then, so wisdom involves, like, you, you've learned and studied and practiced, you know, all these facets, the benevolence, rituals, appropriateness, so much that you have this kind of in-depth insight. And when you're in a very complicated situation, uh, you're able to kind of catch the main thread of it and then find the most organic way to, to respond to it. So the real Confucius is very different than the the, the hierarchical Chinese society that was so top-heavy and so problematic at the end of the 19th century and before the Chinese Revolution. I, I, in the old days, people treated Confucianism as a kind of sociology, and then the, Chinese, the unequal Chinese society was Confucianism, but uh, what Confucius never talked about that. He never even talked about extended family. He only talked about you and your personal nexus and how to make the best of it. Okay. Something like, I don't know if I answered your question. But. Um, one thing I've heard, and I want to see if, if, if you think this is right, is that one way of understanding what Confucius did that was new was that he took the notion of perfecting oneself, of getting better, of uh, becoming fully human, which it was understood when he came on the scene as an aristocratic ideal, as an ideal appropriate for oh, princes mm -hmm. and, and emperors and dukes, and, and dem democratized it, and gave, gave, it a, gave it a meaning for, for everybody. Does that make sense, or was there already a sense oh. of I mean, the, I mean, the line, the, the piece of Confucius that I can't can't get out of my head is the one that talks about the, a progression through age seventy. I would kind of wish he'd taken it to eighty. Since I'm getting too close to seventy, I'm not even on step three, I think. But you know, the sense that I, you know, there's a, a human developmental path that takes a very long time, and there are pretty mm -hmm. good rules for how to proceed on that path. Mm -hmm. Would it have been understood in the time, say, prior to Confucius, that everyone had such a path? Or would it have been assumed that people of wealth and power might, and other folks were just living along? Okay. Well, I think yeah, people had their own ideas, and it was getting more and more individualized, like, like, I, like I mentioned. And then... Confucius' innovation was to, to show that you perfect yourself by perfecting all those around you. In fact, he has clear statements. Uh, I take my stance by leading others to take their stance. Uh, I develop by developing others. It's, it's very much you know, in context in the social nexus. And then if you push it farther, of course, then it, it should embrace the whole, you know, all the strata of society. And he had this other dictum that, uh, in teaching, I do not distinguish between classes, I mean social classes. So he treated everyone as intellectually equal. And then from his, his perspective, uh, a commoner could be a, a state minister. So that's a kind of a democratizing thing. You know, but of course, ultimately, it's the aristocrats' children who had free time to learn and to cultivate, and the, the other classes children have to presumably work in the fields or something. So there, there was a later philosopher named Mozi that 
that said the Confucian virtues seem to ex extend kind of in the fields where people are interacting. I mean, the, the, the aristocratic, the, the rulers, so you have perfect harmony, things going well in that group, but then the, the people are just kind of in the background producing food and so forth. So he, he tried to replace Confucius' uh, benevolence with a broader concept of impartial regard that you treat you know, everyone you deal with on a more or less equal footing. Like, that's like modern Western ethics. It, it reflected the transition from a, a feudal or a clan society to a more general civil society. So it actually was Mencius, uh, I'm sorry, Mosa, who really made the huge push toward a more democratic or more, a more equal treatment of people and probably to make society a place where uh, people could uh, develop according to their talent instead of just on uh, the, uh, the basis of having uh, you know, a better background, so to speak if that makes sense. <laughs> I remember the story that uh, says that Confucius wouldn't refuse someone as a student to be brought even a chicken. Um, a piece of dried beef. <laughs> so it must, there must have been some people who were like the ne'er-do-well sons of farmers who snuck oh, yeah. off when they should have been mm -hmm. taking care of the rice oh, so yeah, I guess what I'm saying is Confucius was probably more egalitarian than his followers were. <laughs> so like the, his later students would be a little bit priggish and a little bit proud that they, they learned from the master, so, something like that. And then this Mozart that I mentioned, he originally had studied under Confucius' disciples, but then he, he, saw, he saw so many inequalities built into their their ethics that he created his own rational counter ethics. Uh, in fact, I gave a presentation on that at the last philosophers, uh, philosophy East and West conference. <laughs> now, one puzzle I've, I've, I've had about Confucius for a long time is that it seems as if uh, he's, he's very concerned about appropriateness, about getting it right. Mm -hmm. And one understands how powerful that idea is if one thinks about a, a society with a lot of well-understood customs. And, I mean, in a certain sense, there you can learn to act effectively, where, which that, where, where that means saying the thing that will be understood as comforting or helpful. Right, I mean, right. I think Americans generally have trouble at funerals. You know, it isn't clear what you are supposed to say, mm -hmm. and there isn't one sort of convention. And you cross these ethnic lines in Minnesota, where you're saying you're saying the thing that you'd say at an Irish funeral, but this is a Finnish funeral. <laughs> they don't right, do it right. that way. Bohemian. <laughs> yes, I mean. Just the differences in the amount of drinking that you do before you say anything at all is, 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 is mm -hmm. serious. Um, so well, well, Confucius he talks about traveling to different societies, and then when he whenever he would go there, he would ask a thousand questions about their customs and rituals and so forth. He would be the humble student, and he would engage them, and then also he would try to find out what he should take back to make his society better. So that's another respect. He's different than his followers. Like they thought they had the best of everything already, but he's constantly you know, learning from others and reforming and renewing his practices. <laughs> so he's, he's got a sort of cultural anthropology tenet built into his ethics. Uh, that's right. Figure that's right. out the rules. <laughs> yeah, so he has very good EQ toward, you know, toward different States, because every state in China in those days had its own uh, kind of uh, tradition and customs. Yeah, that's easy to forget. Yeah, because it was unified after the, you know, several hundred years later. Mm -hmm. So, so, so you have a picture of Confucius who 
know, say, do what's appropriate, but, but in, the, in the context in which he was working, that meant learn what's appropriate, you right. can move even, you know, 30 miles down the road, mm -hmm. because right. what's appropriate will change. So he was, like, he, he was never obstinate. <laughs> He's always sensitive to what's going on around him, and he was never egocentric. The, there's a proposition that Confucius abstained from four things. I remember one is uh, egocentrism or insisting on his own way, and then uh, against uh, stubbornness, you know, against what other people in the envir environment are doing, unless they're going you know, against the way in you know, to far-reaching the sense. <laughs> Yeah, he's a master of flexibility. When I teach about Confucius, I teach to two kinds of people. I think, I mean, the, at least I see two kinds of people in front of me. One are the sort of people who come from small communities that work pretty well, churches that are fairly much intact, and generally families where the parents have stayed together. Mm -hmm. And where that, those three things come together, people get very excited about the Confucius because they say, well, I, you know, yes, yes, my relationship with my grandmother is the most important thing in my life. And yes, I never miss a family reunion. And yes, this is mm -hmm. where I get all the nourishment that my mm -hmm. life can uh, mm -hmm. offer. And I just hope I can live up to the people who you know, built the fifth century farm on which we're now living. Mm -hmm. And then the other folks are the folks who come from communities in which there's a great deal of dissension, mm -hmm. churches who handle their doctrine in such a way as to scare people away or mm -hmm. produce great turmoil in them psychologically, and pretty often divorce sometimes divorce combined with battery and mm -hmm. abuse and long tensions in the home. Mm -hmm. And those folks are coming to Confucius without a sense that there are rules they can trust. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, I, I, and I'm sometimes puzzled because it seems to me that Confucius speaks pretty clearly to the one group, but I'm not sure he speaks at all to the other group. And I'm wondering oh, what okay. your thought is. Yeah, there is a kind of dilemma there. That, well, actually, some of the sage kings, they came from dysfunctional families, but they were sagely because they uphold healthy relationships. Like one sage king even had been tricked to fall into a well by his parents, and then they were even dropping stones. But he still... <laughs> paid filial piety, and when he became the king, he honored his parents. <laughs> so they were honored for upholding the ideal. And then they, they idealized widows that didn't remarry because they were upholding the relationship, even though they might uh, be destitute. <laughs> but uh, uh, I had a, a teacher from China who was a great scholar, but his family had been, in China, had been wiped out by the Japanese army and the ones who survived the Japanese were killed by the communists and like at that point Confucianism became vacuous to him it just became a, a hollow irony it, he, he, it almost made him nauseous and he shifted to Taoism and, and Zen Buddhism and so maybe for the, the people you mentioned like Taoism would provide the healing process that, you know, despite everything, all things are connected, and uh, even if the family's not there, there are people and resources in the environment, and you can always find the center and work from that point. And then Confucianism would be in the background, like, okay, when you start to build your new family and relationships, then, then Confucius can come back into your, your picture. Uh, and also, I've seen recent work on relational psychology. There's a kind of a new theory that's 
becoming very influential in clinical psychology because it's very effective. And it, like Confucius, it sees humans as the products of relationships. And uh, it's, it seems like when people feel related, then it gives them a platform and they feel healthier and they feel more positive and so forth. And uh, maybe from that point of view, you, you need a, a kind of a dual platform of Confucianism and Taoism uh, to address people of all stripes. The, the Taoism would fill the gap where, you know, where you're out there alone, and then it would sustain you and give you a platform to to build, and then you start to establish your new relationships, something like that. <laughs> so one may have to one may have to have some other sort of philosophic help to build the sort of life in which the Confucian ideals get a foothold. Right, right. So yeah, Chinese always sort of upheld these two positions at the same time. And then, so Confucianism is when, when you're dealing in the relationships and things are pretty well. And da, of course, for the scholars, then Taoism would be when they're in retirement or something or or when there's no more relationships to be had, then you're at one with all of nature. Something like that. Um. It's interesting, the, the Confucian position had a strong res resonance with early Americans, like uh, uh, Henry David Thoreau even, uh, he published selections of the four books of Confucianism in the Transcendentalist magazine called The Dial, and uh, Emerson commented frequently on Confucianism. He liked the social fabric involved and the, the ritual propriety. And Thoreau quoted the Analects and the four books at least 10 times in Walden. And it's sort of very key points in Walden. He, he quoted the master as having a kind of insight that was, wasn't to be found in, in Western classics. I mean, so the, it's not this exotic thing. It it has strong reverberations with with our society. I, I really, I, I don't know how much you've gone into it, but I really want to follow up on the Thoreau mm -hmm. connection. Mm -hmm. Because at first, second, and third glass, there's nobody less suited to be a disciple of Confucius than Henry David Thoreau. I mean, what is it? The majority of what my neighbors regard, regard as good, I take it in my, in mm -hmm. my heart to be bad. I, I never regret anything so much as my good deeds. I've never learned mm -hmm. anything from anyone older than myself. Their experience is so mm -hmm. partial. I mean, mm -hmm. these are, you know, mm -hmm. um, my, you know, the, the society of Concord is by and large lives of quiet desperation, and mm. the worst situation you can get into is to have inherited a farm and thereby a role in society and a set of mm. responsibilities which then become this kind of yogic discipline destroying your mm. humanity. Uh, the, the, the common wisdom of of, of, of old farmers is laughable. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they say that you can't make bones without meat while walking behind their mm -hmm. oxen or mm -hmm. doing what they do on grass alone. I mean, what is this? I mean, there's all that stuff. And then right. there are these quotations from Confucius. Can you tell me anything about what the, what as it were, what the connecting point well, I think, is between yeah, Confucius and the greatest individualist right. America has ever produced, okay. the guy who kind of inspired Nietzsche. <laughs> yeah, and me too. Well, I, I think it goes back to this human perfectibility thing that Thoreau is striving at a kind of moral perfection by going back to nature and withdrawing from society. So he tends to quote Confucius and the four books when he's talking about this moral consciousness of nature, uh, something like that. And like Confucius quotes a statement where uh, 
uh, a messenger came from a king, and then Confucius said, how's he doing? And he said, he's not doing very well because he keeps reflecting on his shortcomings, and he can never find an end to them. And then Confucius said, this is a man with whom I can talk, or something like that. And then Thoreau loved that and put it into his book. And then he had statements from Mencius about the, the incipient uh, stirrings of the moral feelings and the communication with nature and uh, the great learning. That's another one of the four books of Confucius. It, it talks about renewing oneself every day, this perpetual process of re renewing, cl clarifying, purifying the mind and spirit, and the idea that even no matter how, how bad you or corrupted you get in some situation, some fine moment, some morning you can wake up and see the sunshine and your spirit is cleared and, and you can begin a new direction. Uh, I mean, these were the sort of mes messages that, that Thoreau was drawing from the, the four classics of Confucius. Like Emerson was drawing more of the, the socialization uh, elements. And, and I admit Thoreau in spirit was much closer to the Taoist, and I wrote a whole paper on the, the resonances between Walden and, and Taoism. But unfortunately, the Taoist text didn't become available in America until two or three years after Thoreau died so, of tuberculosis. Well, it, it, I mean, the difference that seems so, so tangible is that Confucius thinks that this growth and perfectibility can come in the, or can perfectionism or whatever can happen in the context of continuing to be a good son of your farmer father and taking the oxen out every day to plow the fields and, you know, the, the oh. life the life established by what would have to be Concord tradition. Mm -hmm. And Thoreau seems to think that, at least for him, the only hope of, of getting beyond the sort of dullness and routine and dreariness, which is how Americans mm -hmm. picture China. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's one darn thing after another till you die. That's Chinese life read, mm -hmm. read, read through the American lens. Um, okay, but on the other hand, all the famous Confucian scholars, they, they tended to go off for a few years and study Taoism and Buddhism, and then they... Uh, then they come back to their their Confucianism with a fresher spirit or something. That's almost what Thoreau did. He he only lived in Walden for for like uh, between one and two years or something. Yeah, it's and then easy to and, forget that. and then every week he went to town and yeah. you know went to Emerson's house and observed society. I mean, and his whole book is to communicate with with people to connect with people. It's, it's easy to forget mm -hmm. how tied in he was. And he spoke at town meetings. And, yes. uh, he was the guy. And, and, I mean, Walden is not the boundary waters. Walden is connected by trade. And, and near, <laughs> near Cambridge. <laughs> yes, it's, uh, it's a very civilized... Uh, yeah, the sages were there. Emerson and I think Longfellow for a while and Hawthorne. Melville came there, <clears throat> sort of the greatest minds of that time. <laughs> you mentioned moral development, and that leads to something I, I very much wanted to ask about. There's this famous statement, the one that everybody knows if they know, knows in, in general, if they know anything, which is this progression at 20, at 30, at 40, at 50, a sense that there that there are steps to development. Do you think that there's a coherent picture of human develop moral sort of developmental psychology in Confucius? A picture of stages or of I mean, this is a very big deal in the in the United States because we have people mm -hmm. like Kohlberg and Jim Rest and so forth who 
who, who've articulated a set of stages and seem to think that this is a very powerful way of understanding, uh, not, for instance, understanding what teaching means. Mm -hmm. Uh, what, what, what can you tell me about moral development stages or a progress or a kind of normal picture of human moral development mm -hmm. in, in Confucius? Okay. Well, of course, <clears throat> Confucius' statement was autobiographical. Like, uh, before age 15, I was a student or something, and at age 30, I established myself, and uh, I don't remember the others exactly. Uh, when he was old, he could act instinctively. He could follow the, the manda mandate of heaven or something and without transgressing. Uh, but Confucius knew that every <clears throat> person, every student is different, and he adapted his teaching to every student according to their strengths and weaknesses. So I think he, he saw, well, of course, you have to learn everything, learn the details first, and then you assimilate it. And then, I mean, he knew that, but. He knew uh, every every man's man and woman's uh, stages of progress would would be different. Like the the brilliant ones could be there at age thirty, and the, the slow ones at age ninety. But of course, you have to, it's, for him it's a building process. And I think, and what's exciting from the Taoist counter view is that there's uh, you have these huge breakthroughs or of insights. So you don't have this step by step, but you have maybe some growth and then breakthrough and, and backwards and forwards or something. So like probably you, you need to see a nexus between Taoism and Confucianism to get the full picture. And the full picture is that people are different and will go through, will, will, the goal is somehow the same. Yeah, the way mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, but it, yeah, every person in the analects is, an, is a unique individual. There's no like standard person. Mm. I remember a conversation I, I had in a, in a Chinese philosophy course in about 1972, mm -hmm. and we had a guy who was steeped in, in the uh, you know kind of. Maoist stuff, very enthusiastic about the communist revolution. Mm -hmm. so, uh, haven't yet seen, I think, some, some, some problems that came later, but I think it was, was steeped, it was, was enthusiastic about some of what people were trying to do back then. Well, they were trying to advertise themselves as a kind of <coughs> Jeffersonian, like their per perpetual revolution is yeah. in a he, progressive. He perpetual revolution. Right. But actually, it's much more destructive and harmful than they let on. <laughs> right. oh, I'm sorry. But, it, but he also loved the idea of people not asserting themselves, being kind of humble, fitting into the social uh, structure. And uh, the, the guy who was teaching with, was, was a truly great man. Uh, let this go for a couple of sessions. And then he said, now look, you eliminate you eliminate ego, you eliminate progress. Everybody who's produced progress has had a huge ego. And once you start suppressing that, you're in, you're socially, you're in huge trouble. Um, that was, it was an interesting moment for the students in the class. I mean, I don't remember the rest of the class, but mm -hmm. that moment <clears throat> stuck with me. I think if the picture we have of Confucius is often of a, is, is of a person who encourages a kind of leveling, a kind mm. of uh, almost Minnesota niceness. But it sounds like you're contradicting yourself. I mean, earlier it's, you're talking about he brought this perfectibility model, and now you're saying he's the lowest common denominator well, model. Well, I'm just, just wondering <clears throat> what space there is mm -hmm. for an Emerson, for a Gertrude Stein, for Yeats, for, for all these, these 
truly obnoxious people. I guess Emerson was pretty sweet, but there were a number of folks who were, you know, who were driven to rather extreme stuff that had pretty good consequences in the, socially in the long run. I'm just wondering if, if you see a place within the scheme that Confucius develops for that sort of, of ideal or that sort of thing to be valued. Okay. I mean, if you read through Chinese uh, like literature and cultural history and so forth, it's <clears throat> punctuated by these strong and powerful and obnoxious personalities just as much as in Western society. It's just the frame of reference is a little different and it plays out a little bit different, but uh, uh, I've probably seen stronger personalities in Taiwan than, than I, ha I have over here. I mean, People that really seem ex eccentric, you know, collectors, thinkers, uh, you know, just doing things I couldn't imagine. <laughs> yeah, much more so than than in America. Do you think that Confucian teaching encourages that or nurtures that? Well, I think kind of I look at it in terms of maybe the the Catholic school system, they, they try to teach a very <clears throat> homogenized system of values and behavior, but then it sort of creates a, a kind of obstruction to the stronger personalities, and then it turns out the Catholic system produces the strongest free thinkers and the strongest atheists and the strongest this and that, you know, the uh, and I think Confucianism has a similar impact, if that makes any sense. Like, if you don't have these obstructions, you won't have James Joyce. You won't have... <laughs> and James Joyce knew literature very, very well. Right. Which is why he could play with it. <laughs> right, right. But if he grew up in a very blasé, you know, liberal <laughs> environment, you know, then he wouldn't have any, you know, any spiritual crisis or subject matter. <laughs> One of the things I, tr I tell students, I, I'm kind of checking out to see if any of the things that I'm inclined to tell students are true or not. Uh, one thing I'm inclined to tell students is the, that for Westerners, the emphasis on ritual as a morally important it matter is a huge innovation, it's a huge difference from what you find across the board in moral philosophy. Yeah. No, nobody says it's very important to go to your friend's parents' funeral. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody says that's a matter of first importance. Uh, and how you behave at a funeral is a matter of first importance, and mm -hmm. learning to get funerals right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. nobody but Confucius among the people I've ever paid attention to who said that. And one of the reasons I like him is it seems to be likely true. Uh, and so it seems to be a, a, a lack. But I'm wondering, I mean, I've, I've understood ritual to be valuable as sort of expression and training and reassociate and reaffirmation all in one. Mm -hmm. But I haven't quite understood how that comes together, and partly because I've never seen even the great great grandchildren of the rituals he's talking about. I've mm -hmm. seen, you know, I know something about Hmong ritual, I know something about things, you know, rituals in agricultural society, so I have a little bit of insight. But can you tell me a little bit about how ritual works and how he sees it working or understands it working? You know, given what you've seen of, you know, the descendants of the rituals he's mm -hmm. talking mm -hmm. about. Okay, well, well, ultimately, it's the socialization process. Just like when your children grow, grow up here, they learn how to talk to the neighbor, how to talk to the aunts and uncles, and you know, how to deal with people on a more or less polite basis. Uh, that, that's why Emerson liked it so much. Of course, in, in ancient China, things were far more standardized. That um, I think... Uh, 
like we have like other systems to back up social niceties like law system and but in in ancient China the rituals were the be all and end all so maybe that's why there's much of a stronger focus on it but like for Confucius the the strength of rituals is that you teaches you how to to deal with people in a socialized way to pay respects to show your your dignity and also it conduces to interpersonal harmony uh, interpersonal harmony was sort of the ultimate uh, social ideal he was striving for now like western ethics is on a completely different basis it's more like how do you justify uh, ethical propositions, you know, promise keeping, truth telling, uh, why people shouldn't murder, and we don't care about any uh, ritual or other sociological factors. So, so it seems to me that when we look at Confucianism, maybe we we have to step back almost to an anthropological s standpoint, and we see that oh, virtually all traditional philosophy uh, societies are conducted on a ritual basis. And then Confucianism provides uh, insight into how rituals operate and what is their f purpose and function. And while well, like uh, Western ethics seems, you sort of find a way to look at Western ethics from this more general anthropological point of view. And then you s start to see ways to compare with Confucianism. And, uh, in my recent study of relational psychology, uh, they presented like social rituals in much the same way that Confucius did in ancient China. Uh, so, but most Americans are not aware of that yet. <laughs> I mean, we're doing a lot of things the way Confucius described in our unconscious, you know, interpersonal life, but we're just not trained to focus on that. We're not tra also trained to refine it, oh, right. preserve it. Well, when, when you move into a new social circle, then you become self-conscious. And uh, when you rise in the corporation, you realize you have to button your shirt down and, and uh, talk to the boss in a certain way, or else you know, you'll be st stuck at the cubicle in the corner. So I mean, there's a lot of human nature built into this. I remember um, recently I was invited to a, to a Hmong wedding, mm -hmm. and I was very excited because I thought this is going to get closer than I will ever get any other way to the kind of thing, rituals that Confucius oh, was talking right. about. So, you know, a very tight traditional society. Of course, they're 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 accommodating the fact that many English speakers are present and so forth. And um, and there were some beautiful parts of it, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. But the length uh, <laughs> drove me mad. I mean, and then there was the ceremony, and then we were we ate a very disturbingly lifelike pig, and then we were you know, and then of course we we're going to return for the speeches in the afternoon. Well, there was no way I was wired to return for the speeches in the afternoon. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. I'm not set up for a day-long ritual, <laughs> which consists of listening to a lot of people talk. Um, of course, time I, is different in the kind of villages they were coming from. But I, but I also ended up having an anti-Confucian thought, I'll mm. confess. And that was, this can't have not been deadening to the people <laughs> in the villages, too. I mean, Boring is boring is boring. <laughs> oh yes, that's why you have the, all the Taoists putting ritual down. Uh -huh. Yeah, they they saw rituals as the false embellishment of of society, <laughs> when people are losing their natural dignity. <laughs> but is I mean, and so I kept wondering, well, was there something magical about the rituals that Confucius was engaging in, such that? You know, the Christmas tree lights in the brain could still be on during it, mm -hmm. and it wouldn't turn into what I was in fact feeling in the third hour. But, <laughs> of but, this, of but yeah, ceremony. well, he's constantly considering uh, the effective function of rituals. So probably he was trying to get rid of the deadening ones and and stressing ones that 
had positive impacts. <laughs> yeah. And the funny thing in Taiwan is like every family has their own conception. This is how you do a wedding. <laughs> and then they're all different from each other. The, the in-culture marriages are almost as difficult and complicated as the international marriages. <laughs> And, and that would be a tremendous difference from Confucius' mm -hmm. time. Oh, well, well if, if someone from one village married someone from another village, then they might have the same dilemma. P probably the, the husband's family customs would prevail, I suppose, because the wife is marrying into their family. <laughs> but it, it's, it's striking to think that you might have had as much diversity in, in ritual actually Experience. Yeah, he, as, as well, he generalized vertically and horizontally, like he had the Shang rituals and the Sha rituals and the Zhou rituals. And then besides that, you had all the different states with their own mixes and matches of, of rituals. One, one criticism that I've seen by people who like Confucius is, well, he's, what he's not good on, on, can't be made good on his relationships between men and women, and husbands and wives in particular. But I've also heard him defended on that point. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what your thought is. Oh, well, uh, actually, uh, I read some articles that uh, before the Han Dynasty, the women's position was not restrained in a sense. And then Confucius, well, he has a couple statements feminists don't like that, well, you have to be, speak with discretion toward children and women. But uh, there, there's an article about some heroic women in Confucian Analects, and that in his society, the women were not constrained so much, but after the Han Dynasty with the formation of the imperial unification and, and then everything became very codified and then women were really out of the, the pictures as far as getting educated and having any you know opportunities besides being decorations or house servants. Like he, he might have said men and women have their dis discrete functions but then he didn't codify it further or you know, just like, you know, we're better at chopping wood and they're better at gardening or something. But maybe some wife is stronger than some man, so she's better at chopping wood. Is, is, there, a, is there a vision for marriage in the analytics? I think men just talk more about that. Like, like to fish, Confucius never mentions his own wife that I recall. And then his son is only mentioned in passing, like Confucius would pay more attention to the disciples. And then some Americans were puzzled by this, but from my point of view, it's like a, a, a high school baseball coach or something wh whose son is on the team. And then he's worried that the, the other People, players on the team will be jealous that the son gets more attention, so he purposely uh, concentrates more on them and then maybe talks to his son privately at home later. <laughs> so the, dilemma, the dilemmas I heard didn't seem to cut ice as far as I was concerned. <laughs> so, so basically, there isn't enough information about Confucius' relationship with his wife there isn't, and you can't presume very much from silence because silence may have been endorsing a set of relatively egalitarian Absolutely. relationships yeah. in the time he was right. Mm -hmm. Whereas Plato's silence about women is, a different, is somewhat a different story. It's in the context of... Um, yeah, we know um, more about yeah, Plato's society. we know, we know society. more about what was going on. Yeah, we, we don't know much about Confucius' world, actually. That's, that's helpful. That's, that's, uh, that's really, really 
Yeah. Yeah, maybe I could send you some references. <laughs> stuff that's happened. I mean, one can like a view and think it can't be a foundation because there's too much other stuff around. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you see it, there's, there's something, do you see it as sort of rhetorically or politically powerful for, say, the Chinese context as, as a foundation for, for ongoing political and social life? Oh, okay. Well, <clears throat> well, as a matter of fact, uh, I, I did a talk recently at this institute on uh, humanistic impulses in early Chinese thinking. And my idea is, like uh, Western humanism, you know, which is sort of the secular ethics of modern society, it has two fundamental dilemmas. One is that uh, it's, it's based on the individual moral subject, and it's, well, by definition, is species-centric. But uh, the individual, this concept, has uh, been broken down so much in, by like, modern scientific developments and David Hume's philosophy and, and uh, industrialization, mass society, and so forth, that it's kind of a weak platform, and it seems to boil down to rational self-interest, which is not a moral point of view. So like Confucius reminds us, well, selfhood is not individual, it is relational. And then he builds up a whole platform of, uh, of ethics and guidelines. And his whole philosophy is kind of a reminder, we really are relational. And, and what does that mean for our interpersonal responsibilities? And then, then the, the Taoists sort of pushed the question further that well, we're not merely related to each other as pre people were related to the natural environment and other species in the ecology. Uh, so I just feel more and more that Confucius and Chinese philosophy kind of give us a kind of general frame of reference for looking at ourselves in our interpersonal relationships that provides the basis to, to improve our ethics in some way and also not only vis-a-vis -vis ourselves, but also vis-a-vis -vis our, our nature and, and the natural ecology, the environment, and so forth. So uh, I feel there's a lot of promise there. There's a lot of very good or powerful conceptual resources to guide us to, to broaden, improve our thinking in those contexts, yeah. if that makes any sense. <laughs> You said along the way that you've written a couple papers on Bevla. Oh, that's right. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if your thinking about Confucius has come into dialogue with that. I mean, in some sense, you know, you think about, you know, the who are the anti-Confucians in the world? Well, mm -hmm. Bevla's a candidate, isn't he? I yeah, absolutely. Mean, you know, what have we received from the sage kings of uh, the United States? an enormous bunch of, of psychologically, socially destructive messages. <laughs> and what you want to build is an individual who's critically able to resist uh, a set of lies perpetrated by the society. I mean, I, this is like classic comics of Evelyn. But mm -hmm. So what's, how, does, how does that sort of fit? sort out for you. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, there is one thing that, I mean, Confucius put this premium on ritual and so forth, but for Feblin, uh, the ritual 
rituals are simply for self-aggrandizement. It's, it's sort of uh, value-added things, and they don't have any real functional value in improving people's concrete lives. You know, so in that respect, he's very similar to Moza, who I, I mentioned as an early critic of Confucianism, the, against wasteful rituals and you know, three years of mourning and stuff like that. You know, but on the other hand, as far, just like with Thoreau, Feblin is very concerned with you know, individual integrity and uh, earning value through labor instead of living off uh, property or financial instruments, things like that. Uh, the idea of individual character. Uh, like Feblin's values ultimately came from his Lutheran rural farming background. That, I mean, that's why he emphasizes earning through labor rather than through, and then by cooperative labor more than competitive uh, labor. So in some deep core, like he's aligned with this early Chinese view, but it'd be, it would sort of match with the amalgam of Confucius and Mozi and maybe uh, Lao Tzu, and then sort of be uh, accepting of some aspect of Confucius and, and critical of, of other. There's some beautifully Taoist things in Feblin that sometimes he lived in this cabin that he built himself almost like Thoreau, and then he could just sit still in his chair for hours and then wild animals would come and sit on his foot and things like that. And Thoreau had done the same thing, but you can imagine a Lao Tzu or Zhuang in that situation. <laughs> Oh, okay. Uh, I'm Kirill Thompson. Uh, well, my principal field it tends to be Chinese philosophy, Chinese Confucianism, all types of Chinese philosophy. Uh, sort of, I came came to this field through a sort of zigzag. Uh, I guess from high school, I'd I'd say this was the period of the Vietnam War and things like that. So friends and I were kind of very concerned about the world and were curious how we got to the state we were in at that time. So I was deeply into history, intellectual history. And uh, when I came to university, uh, well, I was bound to be either a history or a psychology major, but uh, the most interesting course I took as a freshman was 19th century philosophy. and. I mean, the challenging readings by Hegel and Kierkegaard and, and Nietzsche and others. And uh, after that course, the other courses seemed really shallow and not very earth-shaking. So uh, I decided to become a philosophy major. And you know, I enjoyed everything about philosophy. Although there is such a strong absolutistic and need for God and uh, you know, a linear rationalistic trend in Western philosophy that uh, I was looking for alternatives. And then as a college senior, I took a course in Chinese intellectual history or early Chinese philosophy from the history department. And then there, I was very excited to see that philosophers were drawing on human resources, human intelligence, human instincts to develop their ethics and social philosophy. And their ethics and social philosophy seemed just as comprehensive and adequate as the Western varieties, and they had no, uh, no need to rely on absolute reason or, or absolute God or something like that. So that drew me into, Western, uh, into Chinese philosophy. And then when I was looking at graduate schools, well, first of all, I noticed the eminent author of our logic book, uh, who's from Duluth, Minnesota, was, had uh, retired from Michigan and gone to the University of Hawaii. And I discovered Hawaii has a very outstanding uh, east-west philosophy program where you can do Indian, Japanese, uh, and as well as Chinese philosophy and West, all sorts of Western philosophy. And the tuition was reasonable. <laughs> so I. Uh, decided to go there and 
well, continue my Western philosophy, but go deeper and deeper into Chinese philosophy. And then uh, you know, ultimately I learned classical Chinese and did a dissertation on a, a sort of medieval Chinese uh, philosopher. Uh, and, oh, okay, uh, when it was time for me to work on my dissertation, then I, I left 